Okay, hello, and welcome back to the third and final episode of the Mock Trial Podcast. In these three installments, we have been examining and are going to continue to examine the Ro- ancient Roman Republic's courts and trials system. Now, in the first two episodes, we examined some of the history and looked at some case examples to inform us about how Roman law is used, how it is set up, and the different ways in which it is applied. Now, in this final episode, we are going to take all of that knowledge that we have examined thus far, and I will be using some of my personal notes and knowledge on the topic to construct a completely fictional mock trial that is sort of fantasized, but also, I hope, accurately reflects some of the larger themes that we have discussed on the podcast thus far. I also hope it is slightly entertaining. I know that listening to my voice on playback throughout this process has been torturous for me, but I hope it has at least been slightly enjoyable for those listening. Okay, without further ado, let us introduce the main character that this fictional mock trial will be centered around. Now, this main character will be the accuser in this case. This accuser's name is Lucius Sergius Romanus. Now, the story begins, like most stories begin, with something with someone waking up. Now, Lucius wakes up one morning, and at this time in his life, he is serving as a magistrate. This means that Lucius is invested with Imperium, and he has some governmental administrative duties. Now, Lucius's reputation at the time is that he is known for having a strong sense of disciplina, and he is competent in military, but he is actually more exceptional as an administrator than a military commander. He is known for having a wide network of clients, and he is well-liked uh, by most of them, and he, ex- he is expected to hold a consulship in the future at some point. At this point, Lucius certainly has political ambitions, and he has used the Roman system, the Roman political system, to his advantage because he has great interpersonal skills. More than competency in military command, he is very strong interpersonally. Now, Lucius is a member of an old and wealthy Roman family. This family, the Sergia, are not the most prominent, but they have always been around, and they certainly have money. Members of their family have held various positions of government, including consulships, and that is certainly what Lucius's aim is. Now, let's get into the events that happen on this day that Lucius wakes up, that we are looking at. He gets a message from some of his clients, and they are starting to be more reluctant to work with Lucius. He is sensing some hesitancy in business dealings that he is conducting throughout the day. And this is certainly alarming to Lucius because he normally has such a good relationship with his clients, and this leads to problems for his business. And it undermines his path to the consulship because if he doesn't have popularity among his clients, then he has fewer support in his base. Now, this is alarming to Lucius, so he pursues reasons from his clients about why they're having problems, why they're being reluctant to do business with him, 
why things are more difficult now, it seems. And he learns from one of his clients that a, another client who Lucius previ previously had a falling out with has been telling other members of the plebeian class of some of Lucius's indiscretions. In particular, he is telling people that Lucius has a proclivity to get drunk on occasion, on frequent occasion, in fact. And this is not a good rumor for Lucius to have floating around about him. And it even makes his way to Lucius's father, Gaius. Gaius Sergius Romanus, who was serving as proconsul on this day, hears this rumor about Lucius and he is worried to say the least. After hearing so, he invokes the right of Pater Familius and he wants to kill his son after hearing of these indiscretions, especially hearing about his drink. Now, Lucius is in a very big problem right now. However, being a very competent politician and ambitious administrator, Lucius challenges his father's notion and says that he is not considering where the information is coming from. He accuses his father of listening to low-class rumors that are meant to disrespect not only Lucius, but Gaius by extension, and even by further extension, the entire Sergia bloodline. This is a strong appeal that Lucius makes to his father, and Lucius further appeals to his father to allow him to find this plebeian that is making these rumors and accusations about Lucius and bring him to trial so that he might restore his reputation. Now, this would also help Lucius strengthen his political aims were he to be successful. So, Lucius' father agrees, having listened to the arguments put forth by Lucius, and Lucius goes out to identify this plebeian. It's not long before he finds out who it is. We are not going to assign a name to this plebeian, often because plebeians and lower class citizens' names are usually lost in ancient Roman history. But Lucius identifies this plebeian and he wants to make a real display out of this trial that he's going to put this plebeian through. And he wants to make a display out of it because this plebeian tried to harm his public image. And Lucius needs to promote the idea that he is a strong leader and that he can handle these types of challenges to his authority. So Lucius brings this plebeian to trial, and this plebeian, in return, appeals to the tribune of the plebs, who we are going to give the name of Marcus Genusius. And this tribune, a somewhat political rival of the Sergia family at the time, agrees to be an advocate for this unnamed plebeian in court against Lucius. And what this does is set the stage for the trial that we are about to conduct. So, in the trial, here is Lucius's position or argument that he puts forth. Lucius argues that he has a strong reputation, that he has served well the Roman society in the military, and at home as an administrator, citing his wide network of clients that he has helped for many years. He also appeals to the fact that he has a very, he comes from a very old and wealthy family, and his ancestors too have served the Roman people well. He calls these plebeians' accusations insults and say that they are meant as slander and defamation. He says that they are meant to harm Lucius, 
and not meant to actually tell any truth. Now, Marcus Janusius now takes the counter position and argues that this plebeian has lost money because of Lucius, and that when Lucius says that he has helped many clients, the only client that he can see has lost money because of Lucius. And this undermines Lucius's argument. But, unfortunately for Marcus Janusius, the crowd clearly sides with Lucius here. This plebeian seems to be some sort of a lone actor who has become disgruntled with Lucius through some business transaction that went awry for the two of them. So, Lucius wins the trial, and he gets to imprison this plebeian. Now, a little bit down the road, Marcus runs for re-election to Tribune of the Plebs, but he does not win re-election. However, at this time, Lucius still has a majesty, a magistracy, and he uses this majesty, his imperium, to now come after Marcus with this principle of accountability once Marcus has left office. Marcus, in turn, has to leave Rome, and he spends the rest of his life in exile. Now, as a result of this trial, Lucius has come out better than anyone could have ever hoped. Not only does he avoid prosecution himself from his father, but he also is able to restore his public image. He is able to show that he will bring punishment down upon those that are enemies of him by imprisoning this plebeian and by holding Marcus Genusius accountable after he left office. But he also shows his willingness to be ruthless, to betray people, and his cunningness as an administrator and a politician. Now, this mock trial that we have just gone over showcases, first of all, the highly political nature uh, of the legal system in Rome. It shows the importance of tradition and precedent, and it shows the importance of winning over the crowd and having popular appeal. From this mock trial, I think that we can take a lot of lessons, and I think that we can draw a lot of comparisons to the case studies that we looked at in the first two episodes of this podcast. That is it for the Mock Trial podcast installment of the Roman courts and trial process. I hope you have enjoyed, and thank you for listening. Have a good day.